So no look at the battle of a plate would be proper, would be possible, without considering the role of this gentleman. Captain Henry Harwood, Commodore Henry Harwood, as he was at the time, later Admiral Henry Harwood, as the war progressed and actually quite briefly after the battle. Now, it's tempting to leave it because I could just post a link for everyone to Peter Hall's excellent book. Don't agree with everything in it, but it's a, but definitely a far better work than was previously available and it's an excellent start on many things. The main thing I would like to see more of in it, and Peter knows this, is I'd love more about the Staff College. But that's limited information available about that, and that's life. You never get everything you want in the book written by other people, because they're written by other people. If it was everything we wanted, we'd have probably written it ourselves, but then it would be some, from someone else's perspective, not everything they want. But that's going off the track of River Plate 8. Commodore Henry Harwood. He had prior service. He had served in the South America a fair number of times for an officer of his rank. He had also, as I've mentioned to the worthy, been at the staff and command college in Greenwich, the important things where the Royal Navy's training its future officers, and arguably that's his actual most important contribution to World War II. Most important contribution is the training of staff officers which shaped the plans and operations of fleets for the whole period of World War II. They crop up all over the place. And of course, we get on the senior ranks themselves. So that's a really, really important thing. But what we usually talk about is the River Plate when we talk about Henry Howard. And as the subject of this Twitter event of Lord's work is the River Plate, it's important that we talk about him. He was an interesting gentleman. Let's see if this works this time. He really doesn't look like a steely-eyed warrior in that picture. He looks more like a kindly grandfather, and in many ways that's how he treated the crews under his command. He was a very friendly, approachable person. He had a lot of... He was a very friendly, approachable person. He had a lot of good abilities when it came to socializing and making friends and this was important in South America because actually the big thing which had affected the Battle of the River Plate before the battle was even fought before even we started to consider all the task forces even before even Langsdorff had actually set sail was from 1936 onwards from the moment of his going to the south commanding HMS Exeter and being the Commodore he had started making friends he had started building a network of connections. He had been shaping the battle space before he even began. And this is something you can do when you can forward deploy ships, when you can forward deploy officers for a long period of time. They can build up connections. Harwood had been down in the South Atlantic since 1936. He'd been down prior to that, so he had friends from the earlier experiences still down there. But by the time 1939 comes around, he's been down there for three years. Langsdorff is coming down there, it's pretty much his first time. You know, Langsdorff, there is no one there who's really sort of seen a German ship. It hasn't been an ongoing presence, it hasn't been a continued commitment. So, for all the powers in South America, who was in South America, who might have assisted, who might have been friendly, who might have been supportive, who might have been helpful, they've seen non-stop a Royal Navy officer showing up, being incredibly friendly, coming to their dinner parties, inviting them aboard his very well-equipped ship warships, inviting them to look at how well-trained his crews are, 
inviting them to dinner where they could sample his foods from home and chat and work out how erudite and how well informed and how well trained his officers are. In other words, Harwood has been playing a long game for three years by this point. Harwood didn't know when war was going to begin. No one did. Harwood wasn't preparing for war. He was preparing for war. He wasn't preparing for a war. He was preparing for any future war. He didn't know World War II was coming, but even if it didn't, Come, he would, those connections would still be useful. But if World War II ever did come, making all these connections was going to be useful. It was going to shape things. And remember, South America was always going to be one of those areas which was going to be, have some action, but not of a direct kind. Yes, mainly we could think, mainly we could think about it in World War II in terms of German service rates. But if we look at Tsingtao 80 and consider that World War II could have started a lot earlier in January against the Japanese if events there had spiraled out of control, well then South America is also on the trade routes which come from the Pacific into the Atlantic. It's somewhere where a Japanese force might well go to raid British trade to maybe even go to the Falkland Islands. It's somewhere which is a possible flashpoint for lots of people. So doing all the work, doing all the friendship making, shaping the battle space, he's the wrong phrase, as he's been doing, makes a lot of sense. But that wasn't all he'd been doing while he was out there. Harwin had also been training his squadron. They knew South America. And this is another advantage they have. They know the shoals. They know where everything is. They don't have to stay out in the ocean. They can be just as nimble inshore as out the shore because they know where the risks are because they've gone through them so many times. Every ship has been exercised and exercised and exercised. And this matters. So today is about Henry Harwood. There's going to be a lot more tweets than just these videos, I hope, today. And I hope you found it interesting. It's one of those officers who blow you some study. Welcome to 5th of November. Today we're going to be looking at Captain Hocking Bell, and the reason we're looking at these officers isn't just because I'm filling in time because the grass bay is once again traipsing the world's ocean and trying to avoid contact. I am actually filling in, putting in these officers because it's good to know a bit about them before we get into the battle scene. It's good to know their characters. So, Captain Frederick Secker Bell. I know, how do you end up with the name Cookie? And that's your middle name. Who knows? Well, actually, not who knows. I will be showing you in a bit. But he served 1913 to 1948. So 1939 is actually towards the end of his service. But he's been in the Royal Navy by 26 years. So he really does know what he's doing. He served on HMS Canada. Battleship, a Chitler. And that actually had been where a lot of his career had been in battleships almost. He, of course, commanded Exeter at the Battle of the River Plate. And this is what we're getting into. And now you can see why he got the nickname Hooky. Yeah, the Royal Navy have always been quite literal in their nicknames. This is him with the actor John Gregson, who plays him in the movie The Battle of the River Plate. And um, I know, to get the image, I will give them their credit. It's a lovely image. It's a very cool, very, very cool picture. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is his character. Hookie Bell is a through and through Royal Navy officer. He is someone who would probably have served a lot longer in the Royal Navy if he could. And his most famous quote 
from the River Plate and you have this in Wikipedia, it's been every single book I've read about the action, everywhere it turns up, is that I'm going to round up. It will be the end of us, but it will sink him too. This is always treated as a sort of big statement, as something which sets him apart, but actually it doesn't. Well, it does because he's said it, but it doesn't because actually a lot of Royal Navy officers would have done the same thing. And this goes back to why it was so important for Langsdorff to try and avoid action of the Royal Navy. This is why even when we talk about battle with the Graf Spain, people go, oh, a six-inch cruiser could have done nothing against her mighty low-inch guns or, or a cheap outclass, a county-class cruiser. Well, any damage they've done would have been a problem for her because of the lack of infrastructure. But the fact is also you have the Royal Navy's sheer fighting spirit, their aggression which is ingrained in them. Remember, this is a service which has from time to time hung officers because they haven't been brave enough. The fact is there's always the thing which goes through the German minds and many other opponents of the Royal Navy's minds. They will come for us. And this is personified in this quote. I'm going to ram. It will be the end of us, but it will sink. I'm going to ram. It will be the end of us, but it will sink him. That is the willingness. That is the thing. They will take the grass bay off the table no matter what the cost, no matter what they have to do. And he doesn't look like the sort of gentleman to do it. Let's be honest. He's smiling, looking rather dapper here, chatting away, you know. Pretty happy there. But no. He would have done it. And for such an action, he would have been praised. Let's be honest, at the Battle of Cornell, oh, many, many years before that, in the First World War, and the other famous action, which has sort of got Grass Bay to have a be named after the Admiral, the German Admiral at the time. The Royal Navy commander, Craddock, never considered withdrawing. Some people have called it a folly, some people have called it a result of pressure from the Admiralty and all these things, but honestly, no. It's none of those things. It's that the Royal Navy innately have this belief, especially in this period, that the best way to deal with the problem is to go and engage it. Because even if you lose, whatever damage you do will add up, will slow them down. At Cornell, at Cornell, they lost half their ammunition. The Germans used up half their ammunition. This meant that when eventually the Battle of the Falklands comes along, those ships are running dry on ammunition. This meant that when eventually the Battle of the Falklands comes along, those ships are running dry on ammunition. Okay, they had no chance against battle cruisers anyway, but they are running dry of ammunition. They're in no condition to fight a battle against a major unit, and that is what they end up facing. So yes, the Royal Navy had lost, but they made it so much that the win later on would be easier to achieve. And this is the same thing at the River Plate. The Grass Bay was never getting after. And Langsdorff knew it. Now, as I said, he didn't have the career he wanted. Captain Bell is one of those officers who's picked out at a young age. He does all sorts of things which are, mark him out as being a future senior officer. In 1945, he gets command of a KGV battleship, HMS Anson. That is a very prestigious command. This is one of the newest battleships. It's a very good post. But in 1948, he's forced to retire due to ill health. Oh. But he does get to see himself immortalized in a movie. He gets to see his feet in navigation where he starts navigating his ship, his command, HMS Exeter by the lifeboat compass, because his main station has been taken out, he gets to see what people's reaction were to him. But he doesn't live that long. 
life, but not what he could have achieved. However, he's a very good commander at River Plate, and we can understand why Commodore Harwood was prepared to place such faith in him. He knew he would do his best. Harwood knew that he would come back and fight, and he knew that the offer of, I'll return, I've got one gun working, I will come back and fight with the squadron, was true, but it wasn't worth the risk. Harwood didn't. Could have made use of him, but preferred to send him on to Portsmouth. But he did serve through World War II with distinction. Captain Woodhouse. Now, remember what I said about Hookie Bell. He was an officer of great potential. Unfortunately, his career was cut short by illness. Pat Harwood was lucky. Whilst quite a few of the stations, the China Station, the East Indies, West Indies, and South America, do have reputations for attracting very good, very skilled cruiser officers to come and command them, mainly because the Royal Navy wanted them down there, because they were intelligent officers who could maximize the limited assets they had available to achieve their future jobs, but also because those same officers rather liked those commands because they were independent commands where they could achieve stuff which could make their names. Captain Woodhouse would go on to become an admiral and commander in chief East Indies Station in 1948. He would finish this in 1950 but not retire until 1952. Uh, during those two years, he has no appointment listed. But again, he's an admiral, so the odds are, whilst he wasn't serving in a proper appointment, he was probably being used as some sort of ad hoc advisory. And that would make sense, because, because Woodhouse was a gunnery specialist. Remember, this is one of the crack arms of the Royal Navy in this period because all the technical wizardry we have these days that help gunners find their targets, locate them and compute the angles and how they're going to fire their, sh uh, their guns at them, what sort of trajectory they're gonna use, all these things, wasn't there. The vast majority of it was worked out using this and this. They didn't have access to that wizardry. Yes, there were aids, yes, there were things which tried to make it as simple as they could, but still a lot comes down to the gunnery officer, so they had to be very smart. Woodhouse was very, very smart. He was so good that in 1940 he becomes a director of the local division at Admiralty. It wasn't really a suitable post for him. He was very good at it, but he didn't want it. He wanted a seagoing post. He was a war, and he pushes for it, and he gets it. He gets the pinnacle of a gunnery officer's career. He gets a King George V class battleship. In 1942, he takes command of HMS Howe. And there's him showing Sir John Toby around her. He was very happy at getting command of this ship. It was really the pinnacle of his career, especially as a gunnery officer. But he doesn't get to keep her for long. But he doesn't get to keep her for long. He gets called back. In 1944, he's made the director of naval ordnance. And he's really the kid rouge at this point because he is obsessed with making weapons as accurate as possible. He doesn't like the spray and pray approach to anti aircraft fire. He wants to make sure every shot can count. His philosophy on this is based on the simple idea that ships can only carry a fixed amount of ammunition. So, therefore, if they are firing this ammunition and it's having no effect, they're wasting it. It's wasted carrot, so they've got to try and get everything as accurate as possible. He also thinks it's a waste of the highly skilled and trained people he's putting on these guns. He keeps fighting, and he fights very hard on these things, so hard that they decide to give him what he really wants, which is another seagoing appointment. So he fights very hard on these things, so hard that they decide to give him what he really wants, which is another seagoing appointment. So before the war ends, he's made two in his second command of the carrier fleet. A post he managed to keep till roughly 1948. He, he does that for quite a long time. He's very happy in command of the carrier fleet. So he's sort of gone over to the other side, but he likes carriers. He views aircraft to an extent, and I'm they're now putting this into my words, as a form of artillery. I, that the aircraft can carry the shells further, bombs, far further, 
that have the hardship's guns good, and that's why you need them. So he sort of approaches aircraft as a form of artillery, and it's an interesting approach. Might fit with actually some of the modern technical parts, although I don't think a lot of pilots would like that analysis. But no, he's an interesting officer, and he does a lot of things during his career which push forward the Royal Navy and push it up. And really, it highlights the quality of officers which Harwood was lucky enough to have on his command. Right. Now, we've talked a lot uh, about the other two captains. So, Captain Parry, I can theoretically be quick on, but really I shouldn't be. Because, again, Harwood has an embarrassment of riches in terms of his subordinates. Parry is no different. He would retire from the Royal Navy in 1951 as a full admiral after having served as Commander-in-Chief and Chief of the Naval Staff of the Royal Indian Navy. In fact, during his career, he would command both them and the New Zealand Division, making him have the not unusual honour, but certainly an honour which marks him out, of having commanded two of the Commonwealth's navies. In 1936, he was put in charge of an anti-centre of submarine establishment at Portland. He is one of the few, but surprisingly more numerous than often expected, anti-submarine specialists. So why send him out to New Zealand Navy's division? Why? Well, it's simple. Whilst we always hear about the German submarines, and if we're hearing about Royal Navy submarines, we think about the Mediterranean, and we should never completely ignore the Italian submarines, the Royal Navy was also rather far from Bellicose when it came to the Japanese submarines. So their original plan was to have him out there and have a good look at their Japanese submarine force and see if they could get some opinions coming back. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. World Wars happened, came along and he's instead off the coast of South America. He's been placed in command of HMS and HMNZ Achilles, S Achilles. I'm sorry, there is an A up there. I could restart this and try and pretend I hadn't put in a mistake, but I had. I do apologise. So, one of the great things about him is, in 1940, of course, May, he becomes this Commodore of the New Zealand Division. So, to an extent, Harwood, even in December, November, December, has almost an equal there. Certainly, he has a senior officer who is of a level he can talk to, although he's not his flag captain, so it's more difficult. He's a very excellent officer, and he thinks things through. He has a very dedicated, detail-oriented mind. Um, this is why, in the famous scene in the movie, he's telling his coxswain that he's always going to sail towards, and point the ship towards, the last fall of the enemy's shot. This is to compound any error they have, because they're going to be adjusting for the error why, that they missed by, and even radar-directed guns, not always that accurate in this period. You must remember, radar-directed gunning is in its infancy, so that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It's an advantage, it doesn't make it perfect. And therefore, if you aim in your ship towards where the last shot fell, as they're trying to correct, it actually makes the error that much worse for them and makes them less likely to hit you. So it's a very clever manoeuvre. He managed to dodge going to a staff post after this and gets to command a battle cruiser, Renown. But his luck does run out in 1944. And in 19, then he becomes a senior officer on the naval forces towards D-Day and does a lot of work for them. Not always his duty, but he certainly does see to quite a lot of the anti submarine warfare factors which go on with Nor and Normandy and how they are properly done to make sure that submarines are, well, the risk of submarines is minimised as much as it can be. 1946, he becomes Director of Naval Intelligence and he really does push that to re engage the world. Remember, during World War II, it becomes very focused on the Axis powers, on Japan, 
on Germany, on Italy, and working out about them. But in 1946, it's already looking like the world is changing again, and he's pushing them to re-engage, to look at allies, former allies, and enemies, and potential allies, potential enemies, and make sure he has a full understanding of them for the Royal Navy. And finally, his final posting before he retires is as the last Royal Navy, Chief of Staff of the Royal Indian Navy. And it's, to an extent, disrupted by things, but he certainly does a good job in that he's respected by all the officers under his command and by most of the politicians of the Indian governments at the time as well, because he seems to be quite skilled at diplomacy. All this means that the three subordinates that will be under Harwood's command of Alvaro Plate are all very, very good officers. We always, when talking about the River Plate, seem to focus on the difference in terms of the grass bee's size, its guns, all these things. What is enough isn't placed upon is the fact that you have Langsdorff, who for all the efforts he's done, hasn't had the wide variety of sea experience or the wide variety of postings necessarily that any one of these officers underneath Harwood's command, let alone Harwood, have had in their career. So, against his one mind in battle and whatever his staff are helping him with, are three of four minds, plus all their staffs. It offsets the advantages. So, anyway, I hope you, that's been useful and hope you've had a good day. I'm going to hopefully combine these all in a captain's video for YouTube as you seem to be liking the longer videos. Take care. Oh, and for those wondering, this is a British Commission for Military History tie. Seeing as I was speaking at their conference recently, I thought it appropriate to wear it today. Hope you all enjoy.